right, we're now joined by uh, Matthew Weaver, who is a uh, one of the co-founders of Bronstein and Weaver Incorporated, who is a leading Democratic political media and strategic messaging firm. They are based out of Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And so, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us here on Rational Radio Election Night Coverage. Oh, thank you very much for having me. And so we've, we've been talking about it all night. Uh, Donald Trump coming away with some big wins. Um, Hillary Clinton also pulling a few states. Bernie Sanders not having the best of nights. Are you surprised at the outcome of the, uh, the results so far? Well, I have to say, based on the exit polling and things we were seeing earlier, uh, uh, no. I mean, I think I'm... Um, I think it's exactly in line with what polls were leading up to Election Day. Now, that, that's a fair point. I guess just to give a little recap to all of our listeners out there, and I'm sure you're already aware of this right now, but out of the five states up for grabs tonight, all five of them on the GOP side have been decided. Donald J. Trump has won all five of those states, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Delaware, the most important state there being Pennsylvania. But once again, most of those delegates, 54 of those to be exact, are unbound. We'll have to see where they go at the convention. And Secretary Clinton has won three states thus far with the states of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware, Rhode Island, Connecticut, to be determined. If Sec- uh, Senator Sanders were to win a state or two, I guess he could take a bit pride in that. But ultimately, the big winners from tonight are Donald Trump and Secretary Clinton. So I just want to ask you now, though, uh, we know that you're not surprised at the results of either of these, uh, any of these, you know, primaries tonight. But I do want to get your opinion on Secretary Clinton thus far. She's won three of the states. She might win all five. Uh, do you think there's any chance that Senator Sanders uh, doesn't take this to the convention? Do you think Senator Sanders may drop out before this thing gets over? Is it time to almost unite the party, do you think? I would be very surprised if Senator Sanders were to get out at this point. He's pretty, made it, he's pretty much made it clear that he's going to be going to the convention, and I take him at his word on that. All right, that's a good point there. And we actually had Rich Cioli on the previous interview, and he talked about former Governor Ed Rendell, as a matter of fact, saying that uh, he is an avid Hillary Clinton supporter, but he thinks that Bernie Sanders has the right to take this to the convention if he wants to, and he thinks it may be a, a contested convention. Could this be damaging to the Democratic Party if there was a contested convention? I don't think it is. I, I think that part of the... Bernie Sanders' movement is to influence the Democratic Party, and he, I think, has done that and uh, moved Hillary Clinton in a direction on certain issues. And what we'll find in the polling, and especially, and I'll bring it up in a state-per-state basis, uh, if you've been watching the CNN returns come in, in the state of Pennsylvania, a strong majority of Democrats in the exit polling is based on the CNN and exit polling. Maybe uh, three quarters of them, or at least two thirds, said that this primary is actually bringing party together and creating unity. Whereas in the Republican side, you're seeing the exact opposite. Uh, Republican primary voters in Pennsylvania today, based on the exit polling, was saying no. Their primary is creating a uh, more divisive and non-unified party. And so something I want to touch on uh, on the Republican side now, are you surprised at all with the momentum that Donald Trump has gained kind of from the beginning to now where people initially thought he was kind of a joke and now people are being forced to take him seriously? Uh, I am surprised. I am surprised. I think if anyone looked back to six months ago, they would – all the pundits would be shocked. I, we would be sitting here a year ago talking about Scott Walker and Jeb Bush going head-to-head at this time of the year. Um, but Donald Trump and I has unified um, some very different bases, and he has not faced very much competition in any of the areas where he should. And I'll talk again about... Pennsylvania and the exit polling, just because this is my home state and I've been watching it closely. Donald Trump won, based on the CNN uh, exit polling, 58% of evangelicals in the state, something like that. Yeah. And we're going to have to look at the other two groups that are going to be in Pennsylvania, and this will play out more when we see the results come out 
come out by different regions. But for him to have the election been called for him by 801 today says to me that he probably ran up a big portion in southwestern Pennsylvania, which uh, if you've ever been out there, it's a very uh, blue-collar area. It's an area where uh, up until last two months ago, many, many Democrats have actually been changing their registration to Republican, where they've been Democrats voting Republican for a very long time nationally, but now have finally made the switch over. I would not be surprised if Donald Trump ran up the numbers there. And then finally, you have, let's say, a Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, which was the traditional bastion of the Ronald Reagan affluent party Republican, uh, blue blood Republican. And for Donald Trump to have won so handily today in Pennsylvania, I would not be very surprised if he pulled that group too. So now we're talking about the evangelicals, blue collar whites who maybe don't have a college education and the more affluent suburban Republican. And once you have that coalition, uh, no one beats Donald Trump in the Republican primary. That's absolutely a fair point. And just some breaking news for our listeners out there. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders does win a state tonight. He has confirmed, it has been confirmed by the Associated Press that Senator Sanders will win the primary in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, just a quick sidebar there. But getting back to the state of Pennsylvania, a state that myself and Ryan live in, I'm from the city of Philadelphia. And you're talking about just the, the strong support that Donald Trump has had in this state. And again, a story that we talked about in the previous month, uh, I was very adamant about this specific date I thought would be a day in which that John Kasich would have a strong showing in Pennsylvania that I'd anticipate that Trump would have won Pennsylvania, but Kasich could have gave him a run for his money considering Kasich born and raised in McKees Rocks, which is in Western Pennsylvania. And being the governor of Ohio, I, I thought the electorate of Ohio and Pennsylvania would be somewhat similar in the sense that Kasich could be competitive. In the five states today, I feel like the electorate in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Delaware are all somewhat similar. It, it's a part of the country where I find a lot of them tend to vote uh, in the same way. And I'm just fascinating that Trump had this such a dominant victory in the state of Pennsylvania. And earlier on the show, I read off that uh, Trump won against uh, one with uh, strongly conservative, fairly conservative, and more the moderate Republicans as well. That he swept that clean as well. Could we have? For, could you have foreseen that coming? And why do you think John Kasich uh, didn't have the success that I thought he would have uh, had a month ago? I think. Com- uh, there's a natural inclination to compare Ohio to Pennsylvania, and certainly they're both swing states, potentially, certainly more Ohio than Pennsylvania in a general election. Um, and I think what we have in Pennsylvania that is not like Ohio, where it's a little unclear how well cases would have done even in Ohio if he wasn't from there, is that there is a, this, this wide swing of, like I said before, the suburban affluent, blue-collar Republicans, the evangelicals, and the blue-collar working uh, class element of Republicans. And frankly, I mean, I can't, I'm a Democrat, I've been my entire life, and I work for them, I can't speak to Mm -hmm. necessarily how all Republicans view John Kasich, but I don't see any of those groups really being drawn to him. I think particularly in the last couple uh, days, this sort of anybody but Trump, we're going to gang up with, te- with Ted Cruz and try to force out Donald Trump and, and, and cherry pick states in order to get him out. I think it backfired on them. I actually, um, we, we, I, I brought that point up just a little bit ago as well. I agree a hundred percent with you. I, I, it, and I think it backed up and it, and I will say that, um, Again, with the CNN exit polling amongst the Pennsylvania Republican electorate, amongst Republicans, 75 percent said the nominee should be the primary winner. Only 25 percent said the nominee should, for the Republican should be the, the, the person who has the best shot, shot in the fall. So clearly people aren't thinking with their heads. They're not thinking strategically, at least in Pennsylvania. They're saying, all right, I'm going to vote with my gut and my heart, and they overwhelmingly went with Donald Trump. If perhaps they were being more strategic and more than 25% were saying, 
on, hey, we need to put out the best fall candidate, they would have perhaps gone to a Kasich. But I think at this point it's hard for him to make a argument, especially that I'm the best candidate in the fall when he can't even win more than one state, I guess, in a primary. Yeah, that's a fair I point. Mean, his, yeah. His, his level of, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a winner, and I, I'm a winner, is, <laughs> it doesn't work if you don't win. Yeah, yeah. I actually saw, I think it was a quote from, uh, was it Senator McCaskill, earlier in the day, kind of laughing at Kasich's assumption that uh, he could win the general election seat compared to her three-year-old grandson preparing for the NBA, talking about how just premature, like how Kasich's saying he's competitive with only winning one state. Same thing there. And, and you brought up your party affiliation being a Democrat, and I'm a Democrat as well. And I'm curious, though. It's pretty presumed at this point that Secretary Clinton's going to get the nomination. It's almost set in stone at this point in time. And there's reports that people on both sides of the aisle, as a matter of fact, have actually started vetting VP candidates. And I'm curious that Secretary Clinton now with, uh, we know that she is the more moderate candidate in this, uh, in the Democratic uh, primary uh, in comparison to Senator Sanders. Do you think it's in her best interest to pick a VP candidate uh, that is a bit more progressive to try to get some of Senator Sanders supporters? And who are some names out there that you think would be beneficial for her to consider? I don't want to speak for uh, the Clinton campaign about who would be the best candidate to consider the VP, but I can say that it would behoove the campaign to get someone who is energizing it may not necessarily be more left or is perceived to be more left but someone who is excites the base um the way that bernie has and that doesn't necessarily again mean they have to be more left on some of the issues i think what we have learned again and again on both sides of the aisle with picking a VP candidate is the biggest mistake is to think, oh, I can pick a VP candidate to help me win a general election state because somehow that means something. So as long as we stay away from that error, uh, I I have a lot of confidence they're going to pick someone who's going to be a strong VP. And as a Democrat, do you perceive Hillary Clinton's kind of branding that, that people have labeled her? Do you perceive the uh, uh, untrustworthy, the whole email scandal thing being a problem for her going forward? I think it's something that's been strongly and fully, I would say 100% vetted, but it's been very well vetted in this primary. It's been very well vetted in the national press for a long time, and I fully expect whoever the nominee on the Republican side is, and likely it would be Trump to come out day one and just dump all these, the same allegations again and again. And I think there's going to be a certain amount of tone deafness to be leveling this after it's been going on, that this, this, these allegations have been thrown out there for now almost a year, essentially, in one way or the other. Um, during the primary. So do I, I do not see Hillary Clinton uh, as a dishonest person. In fact, I think she's probably one of the most qualified candidates ever to run for president of the United States so far as experience. And that means a whole heck of a lot to me. And it does to a whole lot of Democrats and, that's a good- and Republicans. And unaffiliated voters, I should add. Now, that's a good point that you bring up her uh, qualifications to run for this office. And although you have, you're going to see uh, in the general election, the conservatives, like uh, Ryan mentioned, will throw those things on her. But one thing that I think is fairly consistent in the conservative base, although those who are obviously uh, strongly against Secretary Clinton, it's pretty obvious that they recognize the amount uh, of experience she goes into the job. Uh, Sid Rosenberg of uh, what's it, ABC 66? 77 WABC. <laughs> I apologize, not 66, but 77 <laughs> ABC. And although, of course, they're conservative talk radio hosts, they do not like Secretary Clinton. But they've even he's even made it clear that... He's a registered Republican, and he said he is voting for Hillary Clinton because she is the most qualified. The, the point is that, you, like I wanted to ask you, can, how, what do you think the, the chance of, you know, we know that there's a lot of Republicans that are strongly, strongly against Secretary Clinton, but even there's Republicans that can't deny how impressive her resume looks. Do you, do you 
you see some? Uh, she, do you think you'll, she'll be able to gain some traction to possibly get some moderate to Republican votes? I think a lot. Of, um, and I've talked to this is anecdotal. Having talked to uh, many Republicans on the other side of the aisle who are voters, and I think if Donald Trump is the nominee, a lot of them they may not vote for Hillary, but they won't vote for Trump. And in a lot of cases, sitting out the election is uh, as good as a vote. Um, and do I think there's going to be crossover? Yes, and I think there's going to be crossover. There's always a little bit of crossover on both sides. But if you and I am heartened by the fact that on the Democratic side, again, this is just based on exit polling. We've been seeing there are not that many Democrats at least in our party, who are saying, I would never vote for, if Clinton's, if I'm a Bernie supporter and Clinton's a nominee, I wouldn't vote for her or vice versa. So we are benefiting from our party because people aren't seeing this as divisive but a unifying primary. Um, I, we're not going to face the same problem the Republicans are going to have with holding on to the base, especially if... Uh, Donald Trump is the nominee, and I and I and I do suspect in areas where traditionally Republicans have been voting for Democrats on the federal level, at least in Pennsylvania, for now many many cycles in Montgomery County, in Chester County, in Buck County, in Delaware County. I I, I fully expected the trends to continue where. Republicans in th those areas are going to be voting Democratic. Interesting theory I want to bring up to you right now uh, as we talk about the crossover appeal of the Donald Trump, uh, how interesting he's been in the Secretary Clinton being able to get some Republican support. And you bring up the thought process that if Donald Trump were to be the nominee, there's a, enough conservatives that may just sit this one out because they're obviously not sa – the, the conser there's a decent amount of conservatives that are not pleased with Donald Trump's rising popularity in the Republican Party as well as Secretary Clinton. Of course, a decent amount of them are not a fan of her. And Chris uh, Matthews of MSNBC, the host of Hardball, proposed an interesting theory just, uh, I believe, um, over a month ago. Uh, I, I thought it was fascinating. I've kept it, this thought with me to this very day. If Donald Trump were to be the nominee, he's such a divisive candidate that would it be foolish on H Hillary Clinton's part to seek maybe a mo like an independent, maybe even a Republican running mate to try to unite the country because Donald Trump, again, would that be an effective way to try to get more Republicans on board because we know how divisive a candidate Donald Trump really is? I think it's an interesting. Um, it's an it, there's an interesting dynamic going on nationally, and it's going on for for last couple of years where the uh, parties have become so much more divided and divisive amongst each other that instead of creating a more moderate, let's even call it third way sort of party that may have been 12, 16 years ago, it's really that's really not the strategy that I see going forward. I think, you know, sticking to our fundamental uh, beliefs for fighting for the working class people and uh, supporting our progressive agenda, the Democratic Party, is, is the best way to get both the our base but also the more moderate Republicans we need. Uh, I think that if you did polling that in a lot of these swing states, the, the Republican base of the party is just wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. It's, it's not in line with a lot of the minor Republicans. And I don't think, I think we're already issue-wise uh, primed to pull them over. I don't think the gimmick of a Republican VP or independent VP is, is necessary. And so I want to kind of touch back on, on something you, we were talking about earlier. If, in fact, we see Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton as the two nominees and moving into a general election showdown between the two, should we be prepared for a five-month slugfest with mudslinging and all this kind of negativity surrounding it? Do you think that's what this uh, could ultimately turn into? I mean, I think you probably feel the same way that absolutely it's going to be it's going to be ugly yeah it's going to be it's going to it's going to be ugly and it's going to take um 
both sides then a pass that they may not, well, at least I don't think the Democratic Party will want to go. I can't speak for Donald Trump um, and the party there, but it's, it's, it's going to get ugly, and it's going to be... It's going to be bad for the country and bad for the political process, ultimately. And hopefully it doesn't turn off voters on both sides, because ultimately we would, I think everyone does have an interest in seeing a really robust high turnout for president uh, election. I mean, I think that's the best way that we should be choosing and uh, exercising the democratic process. Uh, I I will I will feign to turn on the television in the last two months to see the amount of negative ads that'll be <laughs> rolling around and sure. and, it, and and I will say it won't just be on the presidential level. In fact, I think what's really going to do if it's getting out of hand, if the presidential election is getting out of hand, and Donald Trump really does become completely unviable, which I don't think is necessarily the case, but if that has become the case. It, the 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 races for Senate and for Congress are really is are where they're going to run a lot of a lot of the media and those also will get very very nasty because they'll look, I think people at the top will say all right well Trump's Trump's a goner we have to keep the Senate Trump's yeah. a goner we have to keep the House so the Republican side and the Democrats will go hey we have a chance to pick up. Senate, you know, pick some Senate seats or pick a house. So it's going to get ugly top to bottom. I mean, you're going to see state house races. You know, you're going to see state Senate races here in Pennsylvania. You're going to see all sorts of just nastiness to, to try to capitalize. And so now, thank you, Matt, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you contributing to this conversation. It was great to talk to you. Great to have some insight on this presidential race with uh, the amount of kind of wacky turns it's had all the way through. Uh, we're really glad that you could be a part of our coverage tonight. Oh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, we'll get back to watching the results turn it on the internet and really delve into the numbers because we're probably all on the call on the on the radio here. We're all junkies for this. So, yeah, yeah. you know. Got that right, yeah. <laughs> Espe- love talking about it, yeah. Especially the results coming in from all the Pennsylvania races we're looking at. Right now I'm looking at Attorney General. Uh, numbers coming in that Josh Shapiro with 60% of the precincts in is uh, crushing Steve Zappala. So he has a really I think sizable, that's shocking. I really, really do. lead there. And Shaka Fatah right now holding a narrow lead over Dwight Evans, which, again, the second congressional district right here at Temple University. So, again, once again, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>